Get ready to experience the pulse of the outdoor community as we dive into the stories of people's journeys into the outdoor world. And we are rolling. Welcome to the Outdoor Pulse. I am your host, Mitch Dean. Today we have Kaylee on. She is an outdoor recreation graduate student at Ohio University and a teaching assistant there. So she's going to be telling her story today. How's it going? It is going great. Awesome. How are you? Going great. Awesome. So we're going to start off just kind of with how you kind of got into the outdoor outdoors, what led you there, and kind of just go from there. So if you want to start with that, then kind of dive into it. Yeah. So I think um, just like anybody that is into nature and into doing things in the outdoors, it started young. Um, I know everybody has some type of experience with nature as they were a kid. I know growing up internationally, I grew up in England. So we would take these family car camping trips um, to car shows, but then we were required to camp. So like that was my first experience. Um, and then after moving to the United States, we like got to explore some of the nature around here. And I grew up in central Ohio um, and then have been bouncing all over. So being able to explore like New York and now moving into Michigan and exploring like the Great Lakes and just realizing that like nature's always been a part of my life, no matter what it is. And then I decided to um, do this as a career, finding that out when I was 24, like, oh, this is a thing that you can actually do and make this a career. So, um, but I think having that instilled like love of nature as a child kind of pushed me into this realm of career path. And how old were you when you moved over from uh, Britain? Um, I was 12 years, old. 12 years um, old. So I had a good amount of experience there. And then going here and just doing your whole teenage years of like transcontinental move is kind of crazy. And kind of nature was that like natural, like, um, what's the word I want to say? It's just like, it's basically like my grounding point, no matter yeah. where you are, nature is about. So that's kind of what kept me um, sane a little bit as that transition happened. And it's kind of funny, a bunch of people that I've already had on are all people from like the Midwest, which is always kind of funny because the stories of how people get into anything in the outdoors in the Midwest is always different than someone who's like born in the mountains. So it's always a different kind of path. And so you, you kind of grew up in Britain though, from until about age 12. And do, do they have like a ton of do they have mountains or anything over there? I really don't know like a ton about. <laughs> yeah, no, it's actually very surprising. And going back and as an adult and exploring it more is way different. So I used to travel a lot into Cornwall, which is what we call the boot of England. So it's where like Stonehenge is, it's close, you know, all that area. Um, so that's where I explored as a child. But now going back and as an adult, I've gone into like the Peak District, which is a national park right in the central of England. I've gone into Wales. Um, Scotland is just full of mountains like it's crazy the terrain there when people think England's oh it's just flat and it rains I'm like no there's also mountains there's also <laughs> this and there's also this and what's really cool about the park systems in the UK and over in Europe is that they're free roaming so there is really no designated trails and anybody is allowed to move wherever they want freely on that land which I think is really cool compared to like national parks and state parks here where there are designated trails and even in back country there's still designated trails so it's just a different yeah. scope of what is allowed and what's not and that freedom gotcha so when you came over here what was the first kind of activity you kind of got into in the outdoors so you, I, think I know that you mentioned walking. climbing and you know, just walking you know walking and hiking and then that transition to like oh i like the water so i wanted to try a canoe so like canoeing is a big passion of mine um, you know, it's one of those traditional outdoor pursuits versus outdoor like technical things. Yeah. Um, and then when I got into college, I got into climbing. Um, so climbing became a big part of my life until I had a really large incident about five years ago. Um, and we can get into that in a little bit. But uh, and then I've slowly transitioned into like whitewater rafting. And um, I just have a love and affinity of water. Um, it's just calming. It's like my happy place. So anytime I'm on the water, I'm I'm happy. Gotcha. That's kind of how I feel with just being in the mountains. So mm -hmm. I, I know exactly that feeling of when you're there, you're just like, this feels right. This is, this is where I'm supposed to be. So did you have a friend or anything that got you into those sports or was it just kind of mm -hmm. like a draw? 
I think it was just discovery through college. Um, you know, I came from a background of photography in professional sports world. So I was doing things with the NHL at the time before going into college at 24. And then when I transitioned into college, we had a climbing wall. So like that was my big first exposure um, into climbing. And so I dabbled into that. I got into like high ropes and group facilitation things. Um, so it's still climbing related, but just not technical rock climbing. Um, and then during college, I went through cardiac arrest while I was rock climbing. So even now, five years later, my climbing level has gone down because of that incident, but I still love teaching it, being around that community, being around climbers, um, just because it does feel like home, no matter if I'm just your best belay buddy. Yeah, the climbing community is an amazing community. They're just mm -hmm. so open to new people and teaching people new skills and everything. If you ever have a question, I've never ran into a single climber that's like, no, nah, I'm not going to teach you that. It's always like, right. yeah, come out with me. I'll show you this. I'll show you that. I'll show you this not. It's yeah, always right. just such an inclusive and just a great group to be a part of. Oh yeah. It's nice to see other people's passions and that they want to like send that on to other people. So that's one reason why I love that community because they do want to share versus other types of skills. I know like skiing's, um, you know, a little different to snowboarding versus uh, whitewater communities and different things like that. Like climbing, I've seen has been the most inclusive other than general, just hiking communities. I would agree. Yeah. I feel like it just is the type of person that ends up climbing is, uh, I mean, skiing, you're, you kind of have to be near the mountains or have money and it's just a different type of community a little bit, I feel like. Plus, I feel like even more so skiing's even a more individual sport than climbing. Climbing's an individual sport, but you're always with a belayer. You're always with a group. So there's always that aspect of having someone else behind you, someone else mm -hmm. that you have to trust a hundred percent. So, which I mean, same goes with mountaineering. I mean, I I'd say mountaineers that I've talked to are very, very much the same way. So not exactly hiking, but, and not skiing, but, of all the mountain people that I've talked to, the mountain, like the actual mountaineers that climb like Mount Rainier, things like that. They're, they're always like, yeah, if, if you're willing to drop the money and be able to do it, I'll teach you the stuff. But mountaineering is one of those expensive sports. So it's not mm -hmm. the easiest thing to get into. So unless you're like completely dead set on getting into it, then yeah. you make it work. So so with the climbing, you mentioned the fact that you had cardiac arrest. Well, what, did, did that happen while climbing or was it just when you were a climber, I guess? Um, no, it so, happened so. while I was climbing. Um, so yeah. I was in Ann Arbor, Michigan at the time, climbing at a gym called Planet Rock. Um, and it was like, I think it was Good Friday of like 2015. And I'm just like, okay, let's go to the Easter egg hunt because this would be kind of cool. Um, second, mind you, Prefaces. I do not remember any of this. This is what people have told me because um, I've blacked out for a while. So um, it was like my second climb of the day, starting a 510. And I'm just like, I was about 35, 40 feet up on the wall. And I'm like, I can't figure out the footholds. So I asked my belayer, I'm like, hey, can you bring me down so I can like just take a look at the wall? And as soon as they said take, and they took me, and I'm just like, pass out, I guess. Like I just went through cardiac arrest mid air. Um, so they belayed me down and then they thought I just passed out. So they're like, check in everything. They're like, why aren't wake, waking up? Um, and then somebody just yelled over, does she have a pulse? Um, so that kind of clicked it in and they just started checking every single spot for a pulse. I had nothing. Um, so they started CPR right away. Um, luckily enough, Ann Arbor is filled with doctors and nurses. Um, so they actually, there was a few of them climbing. They all came over. So we had like four people doing CPR. Um, they called the EMS. They were like maybe two miles away from us. They picked me up and then took me to the Ann Arbor hospital at university of Michigan. Um, they did like, I think seven shocks in the ambulance to get me up and I was up, but I wasn't stable. Um, so they put me in the ICU. I was in a medically induced coma for four and a half days. So I woke up on Tuesday morning, um, fully functioning, not knowing why I was in the hospital. Um, and then I went in for surgery for an ICD, which is called an internal cardiac defibrillator. So it's not a pacemaker. It's just something there that if I was to do this again or go through cardiac arrest again, it, it's going to shock me. Um, hasn't happened yet. Um, and then about 
three weeks after that incident, I started climbing again, <laughs> um, which was probably not the best decision. But since then, I've still climbed. I got into rafting. I still do all my crazy adventures. I just no longer love to play contact sports. Fair enough. Yeah, no, I, I feel with any kind of injury, you're always itching to get back, especially like people that I meet in like the adventure sports. It's like, well, it's been long enough. I, I, I should be fine. <laughs> oh, yeah the like every minute away from it is more painful than like not doing it so I, I definitely feel that I, I know it's not exactly the same but I, I had a minor finger pulley injury that took me out for like two three months because I just couldn't pull up on the wall and it was like all I want to do is climb, but I can't. <laughs> yeah. And I think, I think those injuries are even worse because you like, my fingers are fine. I can still move them, but it's just like, as soon as you put weight on it, it's just like, so you never know, can I start? Can I not? And like, I had a friend and a colleague from the university I previously worked for that they uh, broke a finger and they were out for nine months and like, they couldn't climb and they couldn't do anything. And I was like, but you're so fine and you can do it. And they just couldn't. And I'm like, just seeing that person so upset it was just like it's really disheartening for little injuries. yeah yeah it seems like a minor injury but I mean your your fingers are your lifeline in climbing so and even a minor injury on your hand is like major and I feel like well mine happened because of a normal injury that a lot of people get because you start climbing you get strong real fast and then a couple months in you're climbing at above the level that you probably should be climbing at for your tendons and boom. So, Ooh. but it wasn't like a complete, I, I definitely knew I did something to it right away because mm -hmm. I, my feet blew and everything, my hands blew except for my one ring finger and my ring finger was the only thing that was left on the wall that caught my full fall. So. <laughs> Ooh, that just sounds great. I'm like, I wouldn't even want to be in that situation. Ew. I'm glad it wasn't worse than it was. It could have been worse. So mm -hmm. I'm kind of lucky, but it was, I feel like it's a mix of going further than I should have gone early on and not letting my tendons keep up with my technique and strength. So I just know that I've had multiple friends who've had the same thing happen where they start climbing, they get real strong and then they hurt a tendon because your tendons take a lot longer to kind of work up and build mm -hmm. up over time so yeah so. Just getting getting over your own self I've done the same thing with mountain biking started doing that and got and like got a little overconfident and tried to do something that I probably shouldn't have done and then flipped over my handlebars so it's just you know pumping up your own tires just a little too much so mountain biking uh are, are you into that a decent amount or that's been the sport that I've like, like my land sport that I've kind of transitioned to. Like I kind of left the climbing world, like big technical, I'll still teach it um, and get people into it, but it's not the one that I like try to push and make myself better in anymore. Um, gotcha. That's kind of switched into mountain biking. Um, that has become my love and my baby of land sports. So we're learning. <laughs> so when did you get into mountain biking? Um, so I, I bought a bike in 2018. We'll say that, um, did one small race, um, and then kind of put my bike away for 2019. Didn't really ride a lot, um, just due to work and travel. Um, and then quarantine kind of hit the bug of, well, I've got nothing else to do. My job kind of shut down at the university back in March. So it's just like, I've got all this free time and uh, at that time I was living in West Michigan. So we've got some ton of great trails. So I'm just like, let's go out and ride. Um, my partner is a bicycle mechanic. So we ride all the time. So it's good and great for that. So like this whole summer, I was probably riding four to five days a week. That's awesome. So really kind of just diving right into it. Mm -hmm. And then did your partner, was he the one or she, or he, right? Yeah. Yeah. Is he your, uh, I, I thought you said that you might be, uh, are, are you guys engaged? I forget from our first we're, conversation. We're married. You're married. Okay. Yeah. So did he kind of get you into the mountain biking or was that kind of like, a? <laughs> um, kinda. So I, back in 2018, he goes, you know, would you ever bike with me? Would you ever go? And I'm like, if you <laughs> buy me a full suspension bike, then I'll go thinking that he wouldn't do it. What does he do? He buys me a really nice bougie Niner, um, which is a boutique brand out of Colorado. 
buys me a full suspension bike and I'm like, well, crap, I guess I got to start. Um, so that kind of started in 2018. And then it's just like, well, I've had this really nice bike sitting for basically two years. I'm like, I probably should start using it. Yeah. And mountain biking is one of those things to where like we all rode as children for the most part. Um, but then once most people get their driver's license, they stop riding. So it's been almost like at least like 14 years since I've like truly ridden a bike. Um, so it just came a little trickier and it's just like, oh, you, your balance should be good. And it's not. And it takes, it's a huge learning curve, unlike road biking, where you can just kind of shut off your brain and pedal. Mountain biking is like all your senses are going at the same time. You're focusing on so many different things. Like when should I drop my dropper post? When should I break? When should my body be over here? So it's been a huge learning curve this summer um, of just trying to dial in those technical skills to do a little bit more harder riding. And what's hard in Michigan is not hard out West. So what is, you know, now living in some Southeastern Ohio and, you know, Appalachia, it's very different riding. And so it's just every little location you go is going to be different. So riding here is going to be very different than how I rode in Michigan. So it's all a nice learning curve. So it's for me, it's like, oh, I can keep progressing and keep learning. Um, even as my technical skills get better, because as soon as I move to a different environment, those are going to change again. Gotcha. And with mountain biking, I know bikes are a little bit expensive compared to getting into climbing where all you need is like a rope, some shoes and a harness and a little bit of gear. And you're at less than like 500 bucks for like a starter rack. And I just know from friends who are into mountain biking, it's a, it's a little bit more of a commitment to getting into it for sure. Yeah, it really, it really is. And I'm like, I'm very lucky and thankful that, you know, my partner works at a shop. Um, so, you know, so we get shop prices and, you know, I work in the outdoor industry, so I get pro deals and, you know, so that's super beneficial for a career. And I, and I love that I do this for work because everything I buy for work, I can write off in my taxes, uh, which most people can't do. So I know that I have that privilege to be able to do that. Um, and to have these resources to buy, you know, these things a lot cheaper, but most people, um, you know, if you're going on beginner and intermediate trails and they want to get out and ride, you can get a decent hardtail mountain bike for like 450 bucks. And that's going to do you so well, but then you'll realize like, if this is something that you really want to get into, then you know, okay, this is where I want to invest my money. But if you're just wanting to like have your own bike to go out and hang out with friends and ride, you know, maybe once or twice a month, you can get an awesome like giant for 450 bucks and it will get you on most trails. Gotcha. And what's the difference between a low level, bike, like a lower level bike like that, that can get you like kind of start it and then something that's a little bit more into the sport. Like what are the things that kind of, are better with the higher end bikes, I guess I should it, say. Yeah, it starts getting into parts components and just the geometry. So, um, you know, I go off a giant, that's what I'm more familiar with because that's what his shop is. They're a giant dealer. Um, you know, those intro level bikes are just gonna be your standard, what we call hybrid. Um, and those are those cheaper range bikes. So they're low end. So the, you know, it's gonna be either steel or aluminum frame. It's gonna have cheaper parts. Um, so, you know, they break a little quicker than newer, the nicer parts um, and that thing, but it can still get you on the road and that's awesome. And then you kind of jump up into the next realm, which is gonna be uh, full suspension. Um, so that full suspension bike, I would say the lowest end full suspension for MSRP, you're looking at about 1500. Um, and that's what most universities use is a full suspension giant talon or tempt, which is the men's and women's version, uh, because it's a great intro bike for full suspension, but then it's not truly breaking the bank because I know some bikes can go all the way up to 10 grand. Um, you know, so $1,500 in, in this realm is not a lot, but I know somebody that can barely afford that 450, what would work for them? Um, but it all starts to get on parts and how it's made in the geometry and drop geometry is basically the shape of the bike. And that can change based on the type of bikes, because you have uh, cross country, full suspension and hardtails. You've got enduro bikes. You have specifically downhill bikes. Um, there's so many different versions of a hardtail and a full suspension. It all depends on the type of riding you're going to do. Um, so we, you know, if at least in Michigan and in Appalachia, I would rather have a cross country bike because it's a mix of pedaling uphill down and like true downhill, 
Whereas if I'm out west, I'm going to want more of an enduro downhill bike just because of the ruggedness of the mountains there. Um, so it really just varies on where you're at and what style of riding you want to do. I would never tell somebody to go out and buy a $4,000 bike. Like if you're just going to pedal around your neighborhood, you know, go buy a $400 bike. I think the biggest thing what we try to tell people in the biking industry is do not go to Walmart or Target and buy a department store bike. Um, if that's all you can afford, sweet, do it. Get yourself out and recreating. Um, but if you can afford to do at least the minimum of about a $450 bike, please do because you get better warranties. Your parts are going to be better. Um, and most bikes that are made at Walmart, they're actually, they still come in a regular bike box and pieces and their, their salespeople have to build them. And most people don't know how to properly build a bike. So like they're, you know, it's misshapen frames all of that nonsense of that side of it. Like you're just going to not get a good quality bike. Um, if this is something you're truly wanting to go into, go to your local bike shop. Gotcha. So with mountain biking, what's the main type of riding that you do personally? Um, I'm kind of a mix between cross country and like downhill. I love the downhill sections, but I'm, I know I'm still not technically there yet to be fully confident. Um, but Michigan is a lot of sand, so it's, I, it's been more cross country for me. And basically it's just that overall hybrid mix of, you know, downhill, flat, sand, dirt, roots. It's a little bit of everything. Um, I still hate pedaling uphill. I will always hate going uphill because um, who likes to do that? Um, but downhill is like where I would love to get to eventually. But right now we're still in that learning stage of just cross country and technical. Gotcha. And then when it comes to riding, what are some of your favorite places to ride and get out and actually mountain bike? Um, one of my favorites has been in North Carolina. Um, so they are a, a hub east of the Mississippi. So down in Pisgah and DuPont. Um, so that's just like about an hour south of Asheville, right outside the Smokies. It's really great riding. Um, it's very different than in North Midwest. Um, it's probably some of my favorite in the East Coast. Uh, where I live now, which is, you know, foothills of Appalachia and Ohio and uh, at Athens, um, they're turning into a mountain bike hub. So I've only been here for about three weeks, but we're going to go riding tomorrow and actually see what the trails are like here. They're trying to make this area into mountain biking and into the next big hub. Um, I've never rode out west. Um, that is a goal. Hopefully this winter is to get out there and ride, but COVID kind of threw a plans in this summer to actually yep. go. <laughs> Um, so we'll see. My, I know my partner's rode out west and he goes, this is really different. It's very scary. It's very, like, very exposed. Um, I know my goal is eventually to do um, the whole enchilada trail in Moab, which runs from the north of the LaSalle Mountains. So at like 11 and a half thousand feet all the way down the Cocopelli Trail, um, down basically by 128, uh, their scenic byway into Arches. So it just goes from forest and alpine all the way down into like this beautiful red rock canyon it's like one of the most pictured spots to ride and like that is a goal but it's so technical um hopefully we can get there yeah i know one of the guys i worked with when i was back in cincinnati was a big mountain biker and he's he's taught he would always talk about how the midwest was kind of up and coming right now and there's a lot of areas that are really starting to kind of pop off a little bit so it's kind of all those sports are always fun to kind of watch, kind of grow and develop. Cause I know at least for me with uh, climbing, I started climbing when I went to Ohio state around like 2012. Mm -hmm. So, and I remember going to the gym there and Ohio state's gym and like all the ropes were open, like all the time, like you never had to worry about. And then by, by the time I left, it was crowded every single day, like always people there, always busy and just the explosion of climbing and watching a sport kind of grow and develop is always a fun thing to do so <laughs> I think it's even cooler now watching it go from you know this recreational thing and like these avid mountaineers and big wall climbers to college settings and it's like the college recreation thing it's something different it's something fun it's something new and exciting um, you know, which then created USA climbing in the sense of colleges and you can get scholarships now and you can compete at the collegiate level in rock climbing. And then, you know, now going in what would have been, you know, this year, but next year's Olympics. Yeah. Uh, now, now it's an Olympic sport. So it's, it's nice being able to see that growth in the last 30 years of where was it in the early nineties um, to now with the big boom in the eighties, um, you know, and how it's grown as a sport, I think, 
in all outdoor recreation. You've really only seen in the last 30 years, about since 1990, there's a large boom in all these different industries, even with skiing, snowboarding, you know, mountain biking, rock climbing, rafting. It's really only truly grown since the 90s and we're all living through it. Yeah. So if you're in this industry, you get to be a part of that history of growth. Yeah. Also, a lot of that was spurned by the fact that a lot of the technology that's come out and actually helped develop these sports and make them safer and make them more accessible to so many people. Because mm-hmm. all those sports like skis turning from straight skis into parabolic skis, all the climbing gear just every year getting better and better. I mean, I'm sure mountain biking's the same way. Pieces oh, yeah. getting more and more technical and more and more designed to take take the hits when you're going down a rough route so it it is cool watching the industry grow as a whole and it is cool to be a part of it and kind of watch it all happen Mm -hmm. but yeah definitely I, I definitely see I didn't even think about that it has been across like all outdoor kind of sports and just kind of like the big boom I guess I think it, like I was, um, you know, this is going back to research we were reading this past week, but it's been the boom of like high adventure sports. So if you think about our traditional outdoor pursuits, what we call them is that canoeing and wilderness living skills and, and backpacking and, you know, all those traditional types of survival skills have been around forever. Um, but when we think about what the outdoor industry is looking like, it's turning into these extreme sports, but, and it's nice to see that that growth. So you know, canoeing and all those things, like I said, have been around, but with, with the technology growth and with the gear growth, that's only really started in the nineties. If you look at most companies, they started either in 75 or, you know, or later, um, or earlier, depending on how you look at that. But most companies started in the eighties outdoor research, I think was 83 MSR is like 78. Like most of these companies started right before most of us were born. And so it's just grown. Smart wool is one of those that started in 1994. Um, most organizations um, like the Wilderness Education Association, um, the Association of Outdoor Rec, um, all these other like professional associations only started in the early 90s. So it's we're still in baby stages. So I think that's just kind of neat. Yeah, it's awesome. I like I said, I love watching more people get into it and as more as it grows and becomes all these technologies are just making it kind of easier for people to take the first step because at least from what I've experienced with my friends, it can be a little bit intimidating to get into it unless you actually know somebody that's in the outdoor community that can kind of pull you in with them, I guess would be the best Mm -hmm. way to describe it. Because if you don't know someone doing like climbing or anything like that, you're not just going to wake up one day and be like, ah, I'm just going to go by myself to the climbing gym today. Like, it's not yeah. a normal thing. I don't feel no, like I, com- so. I completely agree. And that's why I got into this industry is because I'm like, this has been my saving grace. It's just like, how can I help others? So it's like, if I'm, you know, an average Joe at a lot of different things and I see some like, Hey, you're interested in this. I'm like, sweet, let me help you get into it. Let me like give you your foundation. And then you go explore the world now that you just came into. Um, and that's something that I've always wanted to do with my career is just help more and more people explore the outdoors because we are biological beings. We need nature and you know, how does each person recreate in nature is going to be different, but if I can expose them to that, then that's going to be awesome. Yeah. So you, uh, you're an outdoor educator, obviously. So what made you decide to want to become uh, that and pursue that in school? Um, it was kind of a weird thing. So I, I planned on going for photojournalism when I was going into college. Cause I'm like, Oh, I'm, you know, doing photos for the Detroit Red Wings and the Columbus Blue Jackets, which is NHL. And I go up there to the college I was headed for for a visit. And they're like, why would you go into photojournalism? You're already doing this at the professional level. And I'm almost like, you're right. Why am I doing this? And so I already <laughs> paid my enrollment fee to go to college. And I was like, oh, well, I'm kind of stuck here. Um, it's July. I better start figuring out what I want to do. And so I started looking at Central Michigan's other programming and they had an outdoor rec program. I'm like, this looks interesting. This looks fun. And that was kind of my first exposure, knowing that this could be a job. And so through my time there, I worked at our climbing center and it was a high ropes facility as well. So I was doing a lot more like team building, high challenge courses, group facilitation type things. So teaching like leadership skills and interpersonal skills to groups and students and kids and adults. And that kind of got my love for it. I'm like, where do I fit into this industry? 
and I'm still trying to figure that out. Um, so we just did that, did an internship at a summer camp in Michigan, uh, running uh, as a trips, logistics, and med team. It was a really crazy summer, um, multiple roles. And then we went to Chicago and I was able to work at another camp working with underprivileged youth out of the Chicago public schools, which was really awesome. That's awesome, yeah. Um, we taught environmental ed, so leadership development. Um, you know, we did traditional outdoor pursuits, so climbing, high ropes, canoeing, kayaking, all of that jazz while also being able to expose them to um, environmental education as well. So ecology, biology, astrology, all of that jazz. Um, and then from there, I'm just like, what do I do with my life? I went back into the outdoor um, retail side of things and worked in the gear, which I love. If you ever want to talk about it, let's go for it. Um, and then I found a job at a university, so called Grand Valley State. So it's right in Allendale, Michigan, um, as an adventure coordinator through Campus Rec. So I started exploring that realm of adventure programming at university settings and it made me fall in love with that side of it i love working with college students i love exposing them to new ventures and showing them like you can develop interpersonal skills through the outdoors so if i can make your self-advocacy go up your confidence go up your self-esteem and you know that true believing that you can do something yourself but using the outdoors to help push that that's like my whole goal so it kind of opened up there. So when I was at Grand Valley, I developed a full on trips program that is now continuing on through COVID, which I think is really cool. And then I was like, hmm, can I do this as a job? And I said, yeah, and I wanted to teach. So I love just teaching. Um, so I got involved with um, AOR, like I said, which is the Association of Outdoor Recreation Education for the past three years. And that kind of opened me up to a large network of people. And they said, you should really go to grad school. Um, you know, get your master's in this. And so you can teach at the higher education level and teach college students and to be the next outdoor educators. I'm like, this sounds really cool. Um, so I've worked my butt off for the past two years to try to get into grad school. And then um, this year it just happened um, and I was offered a graduate teaching position. So what I do is I teach skill-based courses while taking my master's courses in um, adventure programming and adventure leadership. Uh, what kind of skills programs are you teaching currently? Um, that's been a whirlwind. So I was supposed to teach uh, two classes of canoeing, one class of rock climbing, one class of sea kayaking, and then a wilderness living skills. Um, and then they're like, hey, we're going to shuffle your classes around. And this was like three weeks after that email. They're like, okay, you've got wilderness living and mountain biking. I'm like, sweet. Two days later, I switched. Hey, we're now going into this phased approach. Everything's going online. Um, so my roommates, lucky enough, is also a GTA. We teach the same course, and now we're both teaching two sections of wilderness living skills online. Um, hopefully that changes. I want to take over the whitewater rafting course in April, um, so we're hoping we're back in person, at least for technical skills, um, but we're all trying to just expose ourselves, and most of our GTA cohort is in town, so we're all taking different adventures to work on our personal skills, so when we do go back to teaching, we're ready to go. Yeah. I get that. So with, what was I going to ask? I'm trying to remember right now. So when it comes to outdoor education and all that, I, I think it was kind of, I feel like a lot of colleges don't have that. So I, I feel like I was lucky at Ohio State because I know talking to other people, especially smaller colleges, they don't have that much of a network around outdoor activities like that. I was lucky at Ohio State, they have a group called the Mountaineers that's been around since like the 90s. And I remember one of the original groups, they actually went and did, uh, what's the name of the mountain in Alaska, the highest mountain in- Denali. Yeah, Denali. Yeah. So they ended up doing Denali as college students. So, that's and uh, I was talking to another guy and he is wanting to retrace their steps with a small group. He's a junior currently. So, and he wants to, before he graduates, hit the Nolly and kind of retrace their steps from the 90s. So, but this group's always had like over, when I was in it, I think there was like 150 students and, you know, group leaders and trips going on all the time. And then outside of that, we had the RPAC, which has the, climbing gym and then they actually ran their own things also so when I first got there within my first two semesters I was already taking a backpacking trip through the university 
which was awesome. And that kind of got me into backpacking because I'd never really backpacked before, before I got to college even. But I, I was a skier and I was an outdoors person. So I joined the Mountaineers and kind of just started getting into climbing and all that type of things. And without having a group like that, I, I don't think I would have gotten into the outdoor pursuits that I've actually gotten into because I would not have had the you know the people with the background to actually bring me into it so the whole education educational side of teaching people how to get into the outdoors is so important to keep people safe and make it less of a hurdle that people yeah. feel like they have to get over and that's and that's something that even like I said I didn't even realize was a job like it was a discovery program and in most universities most freshmen don't go in like, I'm going to be an outdoor educator. This is what I'm going to be. Most people find it in their junior year. So they're in college now for five years versus four. Um, and we call it a discovery major. It's how most universities are. Um, you know, and if usually if they don't have an academic program, they'll usually have something within their campus rec program. Um, it's really nice if you can find both, if it's something you want to get into. And that's and that's something that I've wanted to do my research in is why don't people understand that this is a job and then how can we make more opportunity to show them like, hey, this is a career. Um, you don't necessarily need a four year degree. There's many other ways into this industry, but most people don't know that unless they live in those types of communities where it's very prevalent. So like Moab, you know, in the mountains of Colorado, um, the Pacific Northwest, like most, especially in the Midwest, the Midwest is so forgotten. Um, in this adventure type realm, they're like, well, you live in the Midwest, it's flat. I'm like, no, we have a lot to offer in the Midwest. Um, it's just that it's not the pristine, like Rockies, but yeah, um, you know, Michigan's got tons of water and we have a lot of water recreation. We might not have white water, but we've got a lot of water. I mean, uh, within six hours of Cincinnati, you can get to New River Gorge, which has mm -hmm. some of the world-class rapids, like one of the top rapids areas in the world with the upper and lower gully and then uh during gully season when they open up the floodgates it's crazy i've heard i've i've yet to get up there for that but well if you ever want to go to bridge day like bridge day is another thing that happens in new river so oh, yeah in, uh, yeah fayetteville west virginia it's beautiful third, area yeah oh third my october, god over third october in or the third saturday in october uh, they it's the one day that they allow base jumpers to legally jump off the new river bridge and so you have like these white water rafters under the bridge you got these base jumpers over the bridge um media is there like over like two like two thousand spectators just in the middle of this national forest just it was walking canceled people base jump. it was canceled this year sadly yeah, it's so sad because we plan on going we're, we're right now we're currently about an hour and a half away yeah. from New river oh yeah you guys are so close i i'm i'm <laughs> jealous of my friends uh i have two friends that live actually currently they're graduating at the end of this year with their masters and then they're going they're moving out to boulder to get their doctorates so oh, wow. i've been up to ou multiple times to see them mm -hmm. when i was mm -hmm. back in cincinnati but I went to school with, uh, it's my friend and his fiance that are there. So, but um, they're both big into the outdoors too. So he, he was my climbing partner when I was at Ohio State. So awesome. <laughs> looking forward to him actually getting out here again. So, but yeah, within six hours of since, I mean, it's about a six hour drive or about eh, a little bit less. I think it's like five from Cincinnati to get to New River. And then yeah, two hours, the red, though. two hours, two hours south. Yes. Which is great for climbing. I mean, I've met people from all over the world there and it's just a beautiful, beautiful I'm area. I'm ready to go back in a couple of weeks just to get pizza. <laughs> Miguel's. Like, just, just take me to Miguel's and then give me an ALA. And if no one knows what ALA is, it is the best ginger sugary drink you will ever drink, but it's only available in Kentucky. So if you're wanting to make a trip to the red or or even going to Mammoth Cave, like just pick up a case of Ailey. You can get it in Cincinnati, actually. So I never what? had to worry about, yeah, I never had to worry about actually. Oh, we're making a road trip. <laughs> so if you stop by any of the Kroger's or any of the, like the, I, I think it might only be in Kroger's there, but yeah, you can get it in Cincinnati without actually having to go. I, I don't know what their exact reach is, but I know it's not far. I know not it's Kentucky and then, order. yeah, so. But yeah, L8, it's, it's, it's a late one mm -hmm. is the actual name. I think that's hilarious is because it was 
a late entry into a the the like state fair and it was called a late one and hmm. read the name on it next time you see it it's it looks well, like I, LA. I know the name of like yeah. a late one or ala i just didn't know the back history of it of it of it's on the, the story's on the bottle what <laughs> yeah <laughs> i think i just enjoy it too much and just drink it too fast <laughs> yeah no M- miguel's is awesome and i don't know i think that's what really caught my eye once I actually went outside climbing for the first time and you mm-hmm. stay at Miguel's and you camp there and then you go outside and then you're climbing and you're like okay this is actually amazing like I like the indoors but once you get outside I feel I've never met someone that's gone outside and then wanted to not go back outside again so yeah it's such a, although, it's such a completely different realm of climbing too although it feels like climbing is changing right now in the fact that there are so many climbers that will never climb outside you're, you're getting the the people that just pull hard on plastic and i mean they're amazing climbers but they have no desire to go outside Some yeah the and upcoming and comp climbers and all that kind mm-hmm. of stuff and it's like is it is it still an outdoor sport then <laughs> i i would say it is for sure like, but it's for, kind for of sure. weird for sure. i would say like the heart like we've we've had this discussion in with with friends co-workers colleagues and like there's this uptrend in in climbing gyms because some people are like are just tired of the mundane just traditional gym of treadmills and weights and things like that where people are like i want a full body experience and climbing gyms can do that and especially if you live in the north or in like northern midwest especially winters get cold most Very. people don't have the money to start ice climbing so it's just like no. the gyms offer year-round training where people also don't have to worry like um, it's also a financial thing to even go outside. You still need to buy a rope, which can, you know, cost you 200 bucks. You know, it's, you know, more harness It's this and bouldering is one of the cheapest things. But if you go outside, if you are being safe about it, you need a crash pad. Uh, Multiple um, crash pads. Yeah. And those a lot are of times where the gyms just allow, Hey, you can either buy a chalk bag and shoes. So under a hundred dollars and you can start bouldering. If you want to spend about 120, you've now got a harness and there's belayers there. So it's just, and the fact that it's it's so accessible for indoor gym climbing people just like i want to rock climb and that's it where going to outside requires a little bit more technical knowledge and some people i'm not going to call them lazy because they're not lazy they just like i don't want to learn that yeah. they don't want to learn the technical they're just like i'm okay with climbing it's not, a bad, thing. It's not it's a bad not- thing at all yeah also if you're going outside you usually need somebody to go outside with like if you just learned how to lead climb inside you're not going to be able to just go right outside. Like it doesn't, mm-hmm. it's a totally different experience. And inside you're clipping every like five feet outside, you're clipping 10 plus feet, every clip. It's a totally different experience. So. Yeah. I'm so I guess, terrified of lead outside again. <laughs> lead so outside. It's fun. I, I, I like falling 40 feet on a rope. <laughs> I've, I've done that before and cracked my helmet and it's made me terrified ever since. Most of the climbing at the red, you don't ever have to worry about that. So, <laughs> no, this was in, uh, I decided to climb in like March, April. So, super cold in uh, Devil's Lake, Wisconsin. Um, what kind of climbing is that? It's trad. So, it's traditional climbing. Um, I went with somebody and who is, you know, they brought the rack because I'm broke and I can't afford one. Um, so, it was with them and they set and I climbed and it zippered out. So, two pieces of gear fell and I had a nice long whip and whacked and cracked my helmet. So, um, it's it scared me a little bit to like do some big climbs outside again, but if you just, like I said, if you need a belay buddy, you need somebody to manage an outdoor site, I'm your girl. <laughs> yeah, I feel like uh, in climbing, you got your, you know, your indoor climbing, then you move outdoor and normal lead outdoor, and then you got trad lead. And that's a whole nother, I'm, I've yet to mm-hmm. actually be the one to set and lead. I, I've been out with people that have set for me, but mm-hmm. I've kind of just stuck to, I mean, when you have the red right there, there's really no, there was no desire for me to really get into trad when there was so much amazing sport climbing just in my backyard. So I'm like, I never had a desire to really, which I know there's great trad climbing down there. I just never had a desire to really start into it. Plus it's it's also just expensive, a lot more expensive. 
Yeah, like one cam could cost you like a hundred dollars. And like, and you need sometimes three of the same one. I'm just like, no, I'll just find somebody that has a rack. Yeah, climbing is not expensive until you start getting into like trad and mm -hmm. then big wall climbing and or ice. all of that or ice climbing. And that's where my love of climbing still is, is with ice climbing. Ice climbing, really? What yeah. got what got you into that? <laughs> cool. Um we cool. so um, up in the Upper Peninsula in Michigan at Picture True. Rock or Munising, True. we have the Munising Ice Fest, which is an international ice climbing festival. That's awesome. And so it's like you're climbing these waterfalls at Picture Rock, which is a national lake shore, or you're climbing the overhangs of the cliff face of over Super Lake Superior um, in, you know, Valentine's Day weekend of February. So it's super cold. I think last, like this past February, we were there, it was like negative 20 degrees with the wind chill. And we're all outside climbing. It's it's lots of hot cocoa, lots of uh, warm alcohol. Um, you know, this, we, like my students got to meet Conrad Anchor and we had pizza with him. Uh, they do huge That's giveaways awesome. up there. Yeah, it was it's really, a badass. <laughs> yeah, it's really neat. So, but my first exposure to that was in undergrad that we would, because we were only four hours, we could just drive up there for the weekend. And so we had gear to rent. And so we would just go up there and this is like the nice thing about ice climbing is if you can swing a hammer and you can climb a ladder, you can ice climb. Um, ice lead is a whole different ball game because you're screwing in 12 inch screws, but. Um, so just the first the person up. So if you're, so if you're following someone, then it's just hammer and like yeah. ladder or, but the well, person who we, actually, is there like someone who actually sets the route then, or, or is it? It depends on the route and it depends on how the waterfalls like, form that year so like that's the really cool thing they change every year yeah. um, based on water flow but what we would do because of at least how pictured rock is set up um you can just walk on the north country trail pick a tree you know set up a natural anchor drop your rope and then you can ice climb the waterfalls where oh, gotcha yeah so so, so it's just like top rope so it's like top mm -hmm. roping on gotcha on waterfalls. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah no Ice climbing lead seems a little sketch, but <laughs> it's extremely sketch because it's not you're you know you're drilling or you're basically screwing in ice, and so like unless you understand ice formations and ice and how ice functions, because I know we were practicing, um, and I was screwing in a I was screwing in a, a anchor, and the ice cracked and the waterfall fell, so. <laughs> Cause I put it in a weak spot. So just understanding where those holes are going is also understanding how ice functions. So it's all a big learning curve, but, um, I took, I think 13 students up in February this year and none of them have ice climbed before and everybody had a successful trip. So it's super easy. It's just, can you handle the cold weather? Gotcha. So obviously you're in, I guess the last thing that I heard you mention that you're kind of really into is like canoeing mm -hmm. or kayaking mainly canoeing um canoeing has been something i've done since i was a little like little little kid um i it's like the one traditional pursuit that i love um i like being able to work with a partner um and and things like that but also solo canoeing is great i became an aca canoe instructor um a few years ago to help foster more love of canoeing um kayaking is great but I think just canoeing is just more fun. You can haul a lot more stuff. <laughs> um, it's, it's like going car camping, but on the water, you can haul stoves, you can haul like so much junk in a sense, um, instead of doing like traditional backpacking or kayaking trips. Um, but it's just a big party on the water. And I think it's just fun to move. At least in Michigan, we've got a lot of good flowing rivers. Um, one thing I've never done is whitewater canoeing, uh, what we like to call the big banana boats. Um, they've got like inflatables, they're big and yellow, look like a banana. Um, that's something I really want to try. It's just I've never been exposed to the, enough whitewater to do canoeing. Um, but it's something I just have always loved to do. It's, it's very calming, it's relaxing, but then it also can be fun. Uh, but then that's kind of transitioned into me wanting to do more whitewater rafting because the paddle strokes are very similar than kayaking. Gotcha. So of all the things that you're kind of into, do you have one that kind of is like your go-to, your favorite? Oh, it bases, it's, I'm going to say it depends on the season. Um, you know, living in a, in a place that has all four seasons that your, your yeah. activities have to change. Um, so I would say like winter, it's definitely just hiking and snowshoeing just because I'm not a bit in, you know, if I can ice climb, ice climb. 
uh, the spring, you know, let's get on the white water when the rivers are flowing um, after that rainfall. And then summer, I refuse to backpack in summer. Me and mosquitoes are not best friends. Um, so I'm usually on the water. Uh, I try to go mountain biking, canoeing, and, and kayaking in the summer. Um, and then in fall, like early fall, late fall is when I try to do my backpacking just because the bugs are gone. Gotcha. So back to your actual teaching and things like that. So, and how you got into that. So what would you say to people that are looking to possibly get into teaching outdoor, pretty much anything in the outdoors? And what were, what would your first steps be to someone that is starting out in that realm? Um, start early. Uh, my problem is I didn't start early enough in the sense of actual working. So if you're 16, 17, 18 years old, go work at a summer, like a high adventure summer camp. Um, that runs wilderness trips. If this is something that you're thinking that like, hey, I might want to do guiding one day, or I might want to do this one day, um, you know, go work at a summer camp. It's great leadership experience, um, you know, but don't, I'm not saying go work for a YMCA camp because some of those don't give that high adventure. Find the ones that do the trips, um, you know, and then if this is something like, hey, I really like this, or if you're a freshman or even a sophomore in college, see what programs are doing. Like I say, like, don't, don't do something that you don't love just for the money. Um, like most people that go into outdoor recreation, we're never doing this for the money. It's because we love what we do um, because we know we're not going to get paid well. Uh, <laughs> that is a good preface. You will not get paid well in this industry, but you get to have lifelong learning and help inspire others. But I think the big thing with, oh, why is my phone going off? <laughs> um, <It's> fine. <laughs> no, the big thing is uh, just exposing yourself to new things. So if you want to try climbing, then go to a gym and ask somebody like, Hey, how did you get into this? Um, if you are, especially from the Midwest and you feel like I have to move out West to do things, you don't, um, you know, find things in your local area, find a local gym, find a local thing. Like if you're like, how do I get into paddling? Then start looking up the American Canoe Association. They know everything and all about paddling between whitewater, kayaking, canoeing, stand up paddle boarding. Um, you can earn certifications through them to become an instructor. Um, if that's truly where you want to dial in at, um, like I said, a colleague of mine is an American uh, AMGA, which is the American Mountain Guide Association. He started that process. Um, and you don't need a four year degree to do that. Um, you know, our whole career path, especially if you're in high adventure relies on certifications. Um, you don't necessarily need degrees. So unless you're really wanting to get into management and administration and policy development or working in higher education, you don't necessarily need a master's degree. You don't necessarily need a bachelor's degree. You need the technical experience um, and the interpersonal. Like interpersonal is also we call a skill. You know, there's these old terminologies between hard skills and soft skills. And I personally don't like to use that terminology. We like to use like technical skills and interpersonal skills. So like if you know how to communicate, talk, you know, to people and understand how groups function. That's awesome. That's a huge skill to have in this field. Um, you know, go on an outward bound semester course if you can afford it. Um, that's huge learning opportunities. Um, you know, gap year programs. I should say everybody should not start college right away. You know, take a few years off and go explore and do these things if you have that ability to do so. Um, you know, but if this is something where you're like, no, I really want to become a true outdoor educator and work in this field permanently, then yeah, go for a degree. And, um, but you, that doesn't mean you need to start. Like I didn't start my degree till I was 24. I'm 28 now in grad school. Um, you know, you can do this at any time. Don't feel like it has to be rushed. Um, like I know my roommates, one is 23, the other one's 22. Um, and we're all in the same spot in our life of grad school. So it really doesn't matter when you start. It just where do you want to go? If you want to go high adventure, or if you want to go even on the environmental education side, if you like, I love to teach and I love nature and I want to teach kids and adults about, um, you know, trees and animals and plants and, you know, the flora and fauna of this world, then sweet, go learn about interpretation, go learn about environmental education. You can be in environmental science, you can go into biology, you can go into ecology in college and get those degrees and that experience. And then, you know, work summers at like, where the Student Conservation Alliance or with the US Forest Service or try to get an internship with the National Park Service. And then that's gonna help you get into that realm of things. Like outdoor recreation is so massive that 
we say there's two sides. You have the recreation and education, and then you have the industry. So if you're like, I love marketing and I love social media and I love doing these types of things, sweet, but I want to work in the outdoors, then get a marketing degree and go work for a, an outdoor company. Go work for an organization. If you're somebody that likes the medical field and you're like, I've always wanted to be a doctor. I've always wanted to be like a paramedic. Sweet, go get that. And then you can be a wilderness medic. You can be a wilderness pararescue in the National Park Service. Like there's so many plethora of jobs. It just, you, you don't have to fit the mold. You can find what fits you with your personal interests, which that's what a lot of people don't understand about this industry, that it's massive. It's the second largest industry in the country that brings money in. The first is pharmaceuticals. The outdoor industry is the next grossing biggest economic value to the United States. So there's so many opportunities. Just where do you think you fit? I forget how many billion, but it's, it's so far the last report back, I think in 2018, it was $887 billion. Industry. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember seeing that and just being like, really, that's the second, <laughs> not yeah. like something else. So it, it blows my mind how massive that the outdoor industry is. So, I mean, there's, there's plenty of opportunity in the outdoor community to mm -hmm. get out there and like, find your spot find out where you fit in for sure I mean I'm still trying to figure out where I fit in the outdoor community so <laughs> same, same that's why I'm in grad school because COVID's like hey you won't have a job in the fall go do something so we're in grad school still trying to figure out where is my place in this field and in this industry and the next step so what do you think your what what's your plan then are, are you planning on staying in the educational field and like in a college and teaching in that sense and running outdoor programs and the outdoor kind of because I know at Ohio State there was uh, a guy that taught a bunch of the outdoor classes and ran the outdoor program and all those outdoor everything kind of connected to the outdoor he kind of managed all of it he was like the the I, I don't know what it would be called in but like yeah. the man he, he, yeah he's probably like the programmer because i don't think oh yeah i don't know if ou actually or osu has a education program but um i don't really know i know the past like at least four years my goal has to been a college professor um you know eventually getting a phd or a doctorate of some sort in the like 15 year plan of my life um but i know that that's not realistic in the next two years um yeah, you know, I've, worked, I've worked in campus rack and doing adventure programming through, you know, outdoor adventure centers at universities. Um, and that's a love of mine, but all in all, it's just like, I just want to teach. So if I'm working at like an organization, like a nonprofit, and we're still teaching people about outdoor recreation and still giving them those experiences and those skills, that's awesome. Um, if I go back into the retail side, in a sense, I'm still teaching people just in a different way about the outdoors. So I'm like, I'm also okay with that. But I think the ultimate goal is to stay in the university setting um, only because I love working with college students. It's my favorite age of people to work with um, because there is just so much uncertainty and so much growth that happens in your early 20s and even in your mid 20s um, that if I can be a part of someone's life and career choices and career path, like that's where my love comes from is helping other people. Um, but you know, we'll see where the wind takes me and where we go with it. We don't really know. Yeah, no, I completely feel that everything's been kind of up in the air. And ever since I didn't really start really even thinking about starting the podcast about this kind of stuff until I even moved out here and it mm -hmm. was a pivot off of something else I was trying to work on. So I, I'm still, you know, feeling it out, you know, seeing, seeing where things go. So <laughs> You know, and that's, and that's something I've even thought about. I'm like, should I start a podcast? I like talking. I like talking and educating people. And um, I've been the weird person to get on TikTok and like start sharing information that way. Cause I'm like, you know, millions of people see this. So I'm just like, if I just come up on your for you page and you're going to get this information somehow. Yeah. So it's just still trying to figure out where do we fit? You know, if it's a if it's podcast, if Honestly, it's YouTube, podcast, if it's whatever. I I, I will say from starting one now, it's really not too bad. And then even if you did just like a solo, like informative one and just taught that way and like small, because every podcast kind of has a different kind of flow to it. Like some are like 10 minute long ones, some are longer like this conversational hour long, hour plus long episodes. Other ones are 
somewhere in the middle. Some are informative, some are conversational, some are this, some are that. It, it kind of just it takes the form that you want it to take. And they're mm -hmm. really not too comp complex. There's obviously you want to get rid of background noise and but the editing's really not too bad. I mean, I've never edited anything before and I'm not having too bad of a problem with it. So it's really not too complicated. The biggest thing that you really want is just that audio. And you can start off with an iPhone if you really want it to. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's really more like, a, it's more time. Time is yeah. time is a big thing in this industry. And right now I don't have a lot of it. <laughs> Time is the master of all. <laughs> now, re reading, reading like 14, 15 research papers a week is taking up all my time. Doesn't sound like fun. <laughs> it not like fun. It's not what I signed up for in grad school, but that is what grad school is. It's a lot of reading and it's a lot of analyzing other people's outdoor work. And like, we just, like this whole past week was about assessing adventure risk and is risk really necessary to teach outdoor recreation and like who actually thinks about that stuff. And but that's a huge component of how we teach. I never even thought about that. Yeah, no, risk yeah. is, there's always a risk in the outdoors. And well, there's inherent and then there's perceived, how we perceive our own risk in these situations yeah. versus the actual risk that is there. So it's something that we just spent, you know, reading a hundred pages of different research articles about people researching risk within adventure settings and how we use it to manipulate programs and how we use it to advance, you know, people's skills. It's, it's, but those are the concepts we talk about. And most people that go into the outdoors don't realize that those are actual concepts. So learning that side of it, that that's kind of what the grad school is to get that scholarly work. Yeah, no, I, I definitely feel the whole perceived risk versus not like the actual risk because especially in like climbing, right? Like you go out and there's things that'll like scare you, but then once they actually happen to you, like, you know, falling, falling on a lead fall on a rope, and learning to trust your gear mm -hmm. like your, your gear is good your gear is strong you're it's gonna catch you like almost every single time like unless you like come around a corner and catch like a knife edge and it cuts your rope like which that happens very 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 rarely yeah exactly so and you have to be climbing the right route for it fall at the right point and just fall in the right way that it just mm -hmm. but it it's and then as long as you're doing your as long as you're sound and your skill set and you know what you're doing, it's and you trust your gear, the safety's all there. I mean, climbing's safer than driving. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I think most things are safer than driving. And then one of the sports that I didn't realize till I really looked into it, skydiving's extremely safer than like anything. It's like, <laughs> yeah, the only thing that can go wrong is if you fold your parachute wrong. Exactly. Just don't fold your parachute. Usually, usually if you're somebody that's just paying to, you know, jump out of an airplane, you're not the one folding the chute. It's somebody that's yeah. taken hundreds of hours. Uh, one of my really good friends, um, Amy Adamissimo, she is actually a skydiving instructor. She runs out of Skydive Chicago, uh, Grand Haven Skydive, which is where I'm originally from. She runs out of Cleveland. Like she's this badass woman. That's awesome that is a ski instructor she's ski patrol she's an emt she's a skydiving instructor she she just took over my old job at the university and like she's just this badass person like uh, who's been teaching me a lot about skydiving and like what it takes like, they have to have over like five thousand hours of yeah. like before truly being an instructor they have to have so many jumps to 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 teach tandem jumping and then you have to have even more if you're going to do solo jumps like there's so much with it yeah. Um, that it is truly one of the safest activities you can do but and this is what i think about cars is going faster can be safer but if there's an accident <laughs> it's catastrophic oh yeah um, and that is the downside of adventure is that um you know doing these higher risk activities like jumping out of an airplane it's one of the safest but if something were to go wrong it can end really badly oh yeah <laughs> whereas you're doing one activity where you might have a lot of smaller injuries and over time like there's more but there's they're not as catastrophic um you know and then that's just going back to that where is your risk limit exactly and yeah, no, i actually already had someone on that is a sky i wonder if they because skydiving community is not that that Very big I, I i wonder if they know each other possibly uh, i know she's she for a while there was 
literally traveling around since she's a massage therapist and was doing massage therapy at the jump sites for the instructors. That'd be amazing. And that's how she was paying her way to kind of just travel around for a bit. And I'm mm-hmm. like, that's actually awesome. Because <laughs> who doesn't want a massage? Exactly. And skydivers who are taking the shoot pops like multiple times a day. I mean, hell yeah. <laughs> they're yeah. not gonna say no no have you ever skydived before i've been twice i want to get okay. my you i want to get my license like. yes i i, I want to get my license here in the next couple years and actually be able to just jump around the u.s wherever i want to mm-hmm. so that's just eventually do a bridge day eventually i mean that's <laughs> that's if i really get into it and i mean the the girl i had on she did 150 jumps last year yep so I mean, she's getting up to the point where she's about to be allowed to put on a wingsuit and things like that. So it's, it's, I feel like once you get into a sport like that, it kind of <laughs> just takes it, over for a bit. Because <laughs> it's an adrenaline and you yeah. don't want to give up that adrenaline. And I like, I know I'm lucky enough, my, my dad's uncle. So my great uncle um, in Ohio actually owns a skydiving airport. Which uh, airport? It's a uh, uh, Canton Skydive, so it's off okay, of US Canton. 62. I was going to say, if it's one of the ones down near Cincinnati, my dad flew skydivers for a bit before he got his job where he's at now. Um, but yeah, when he when we first moved back to Cincinnati, one of the jobs that he had for a bit was flying skydivers out of, I forget the name of the jump site, but it's in between oh, uh, Cincinnati and Dayton. Gotcha. I'm trying to remember no, it's right now. Over there. It's somewhere over there in the middle of the cornfields, like all of them. <laughs> and which is perfect. But yeah, I was lucky enough to do my first jump at 13 just because it was family owned and operated. So yeah. it was my own family. So I've been jumping since I was 13, but never really had an interest in becoming an instructor for it. Cause I'm like, I don't need to do that because that's going to take over my life. Do you have your license? Or... Um, I did. Um, I let it, I never kept, I never renewed it. So how, how, how do you renew it then? Do you just have to have you a have certain to, number of jumps, jumps per year? Yeah, it's just gotcha. keeping up with jumps and trainings and things like that. It's kind of like continued education credits. Um, it's just, I don't have the time or the money because even if you have your own shoot, you still have to pay for the gas to jump. So it's still about $75 per jump. And I'm just like, I just don't have that expendable cash right now to go do that. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, skydiving is definitely one of those more expensive. <laughs> but when I, I I didn't realize that the skydiving community had a similar setup where a lot of the sky like the drop zones have campsites and people literally camp mm-hmm. there. Like, you know, down at Miguel's, people camp there and then climb. People camp at the jump site and then jump. People camp at the ski slope and then ski. I mean, it's across the whole outdoor community. We're all well, a bunch of dirt bags. <laughs> well, when your job when your job doesn't pay you enough for a house, then you you figure <laughs> out how to do what you want to do. So, exactly, we we figure out a way. I, I definitely feel like the outdoor community is where there's a will, there's a way, because we we will figure out a way to do our sports and do the things that we love. Oh yeah, I just had one of my students like he got exposed to Moab for the first time this spring break, like the week. Oh great. <laughs> And he's and he's an avid climber and he's been out to red rocks in in nevada and it was the first time we exposed him to crack climbing in moab and he goes i want to move out here so he like graduated in august and he sent me a snapchat and he goes i'm driving i'm going to moab thanks for like taking me to this place because he's now guiding out there and i'm just like oh that's awesome that's one experience Dang. in march he goes I'm guiding now. And it's just like, if it wasn't for us going, so it's like, it's those moments that I loved being able to expose other people to yeah. their passions. Um, but like now he's out there. So it's just like the outdoor community, like finds a way to do what they want to do. Yeah. No, that's crazy that like, I've not had like an experience of like having that experience of exposing someone to that. And then like a couple months later, them being like, yo, I'm out. <laughs> yeah. It's, and, but that's education, that, that's yeah. teaching and being able to foster that growth in others. Like, that's why I do what I do. No matter if it's in the outdoors, if it was in any other type of field, I think no matter, I would still be trying to teach. Gotcha. Uh, is there anything else? I don't know if I have like anything else really 
question was yeah i think covered pretty much everything that you do slightly <laughs> i don't so think there's fun. anything else <laughs> Is there anything that I that that you missed? No. Any other sports that you're into that besides? I think we hit climbing. We hit. Is crocheting yeah. a sport? I don't think so. <laughs> no. Um, I think we covered I think, it all. Yeah, I say like the only thing is is if people want to do this, just reach out and find people. Gotcha. And then, what kind? So, what are some of the I guess the last thing that we can kind of touch on is besides formal education, if you're going that route, what are some of the, the better guide schools out there in the places like that, that people that you could point people towards for getting certifications and getting kind of, yeah. or, or websites that they can use to find those? Um, that's the, uh, finding a website to find this information has been, there's not one spot to find yeah. it all. Um, you know, it really depends on where you want to go. If you're wanting to get into outdoor climbing and guiding that way, um, an AMGA is where you want to be. If you are looking like, I just want to run climbing walls and, and manage indoor climbing, then the Professional uh, Climbing Association, so P, uh, PCGI, um, is great. They're based out of Oregon. If you are wanting to get into whitewater or any kind of water sport, the American Canoe Association, um, even though it says canoe in the name, they cover everything. So that's another place to go. And you can do their certifications, which are going to be reputable everywhere. And you can even start your own company. Like as a guide, you, at least with canoeing and kayaking certifications, once you have that, you can start your own company and then get contracted out to places to certify people. Um, you know, I have to do those all in house at a university. So I still have to keep those up. But if like in the summer I can go get hired, somebody can contract me to then teach their, their workers or their people, these skills, gotcha. um, you know, if you want to get into challenge coursework and that stuff, the Ameri uh, association of challenge course technology. So if you're into engineering and you love CAD and you love building like with wood in your hands, um, you can be a challenge course builder and they make bank. Uh, one of my best friend's boyfriend, one is a challenge course builder. And I think he makes 80 grand a year and he's like 26. Um, you know, if you want to get in the medical side of things then look up getting into like getting your wilderness first responder is kind of like the start. Um, or you could do your wilderness EMT and become an instructor for that. And that's a long lifelong process. Uh, but you're required to stay in EMT and have that medical training. So if that's the side you're interested in, there's jobs. If you're wanting to go National Park Service, start getting those internships. And, you know, USA Jobs is where everybody has to start because there is a formal process of federal jobs within the outdoors. Um, so that's kind of where you start with that. It's, I would say the best advice to do is find somebody that is doing the job you want and ask them, how do you get there? How do I do what you're doing? Uh, because then they can give you the true ins and outs of the steps that they took to get there because federal jobs at least with the national park service it's it's all on who you know and in this industry it really is on who do you know because then they're going to be able to ones to help you get there like i didn't get my assistantship at college without being a part of the association and meeting these people um, i know some people haven't gotten jobs unless they knew the somebody that ran that company um, you know we don't like saying this but it really is who you know um, and just networking your butt off. Networking during COVID's been a little bit rough, though. <laughs> yeah, but there's always like you'd be surprised about how yeah. many outdoor educators are on LinkedIn. I know it's not the best thing to use or email. Like, who who isn't a narcissist that doesn't like to talk about themselves? So yeah. if you are purposely wanting to find a job, like go find somebody, email them. They will probably gladly talk about themselves and their experiences. Oh, yeah. I will say I am a part of a group on Facebook called uh, Outdoor Base Camp. Uh, what, what's the it's name like Base Camp Outdoor Jobs. Um, yeah, Base Camp Outdoor Jobs and more. Yeah, which honestly, it, just every day in that community, there's people posting in there too, which that's honestly a great resource, at yeah, least that I've run into. Yeah, there's another one that's called like outdoor education jobs. So if you want to go more of the education and yeah. intern route, there's going to be jobs on that Facebook as well. Um, you know, there's uh, outdoor industry or outdoor jobs USA. 
Like there's so many jobs. It just really depends on what you're wanting to do. Yeah. Gotcha. Well, thank you very much for coming on. Uh, do you have anything else that you want to end with? No, Talk thanks for having class? me. This has been really awesome to just get to meet you and hang out and yeah. talk. Awesome. Thank you very much. And I will see you guys on the next episode.